Hello everyone and welcome to the show. I am your host Kevin Yapte and this is the Geek Nighter podcast. And specifically this series is about databases where we talk about different databases with experts. So today's episode is about Scylla DB which is known to be monstrously fast, highly scalable, high throughput, low latency and everything good that you can talk about a database. It's present in Scylla DB. And we want to understand how exactly Scylla DB works. and how does it compare with something like apache cassandra because that's the direct comparison i often see and to do that i have philip with me from siladb who is going to explain us so that we can understand the internals of siladb and how different optimizations work and what makes it so fast so thanks a lot philip for joining us today and i'm really excited to have you why don't you start with a little bit of introduction about yourself what you do at siladb and uh, yeah let's get started Thank, thank you very much uh, for the invitation, KV, and I would like to cheer for you on that series that you are doing. I pretty much watch it then now, so I really love it. The talk you had with Alex Degree on DynamoDB, and I also love it the, the both the, the both talks you did with Patrick Cassandra, particularly in their last talk. They spoke about the roadmap, and I know mm. they are going to bring us very exciting and cool features. We can make some parallel about the during our talk today. But speaking about me, I work primarily as a solution architect here at SolidDB. So mm -hmm. I am typically uh, working very closely with customers in teaching them, helping them to actually implement SolidDB as part of their uh, high high throughput, low latency workloads. I've joined the company for around three years by now. And uh, I'm also a published author, which I wrote here at SolidDB, so Database Performance at Scale, and which is not a book about SolidDB alone, even though since most of the authors work for SolidDB, we do use SolidDB examples at several chapters. And the book was primarily intended to serve as an introduction for you if you are getting started with NoSQL databases, if you are currently having a performance problem in your workload on your application and we try to discuss all the nuances all the aspects that drive performance as a whole so yeah the book is free you can it's open access so you can download it online or get a pdf copy and i also saw that you came you were you were reading the book and you even tweeted about it and but my my question to you actually is in your tweet I saw that you were reading it while you're drinking coffee and eating something some kind of sandwich What were you eating? Because that looked really delicious. Yeah, it, it is delicious. I do that daily, so it's become my what I do in in the morning. So I have a flat white coffee along with a. It's mm -hmm. a simple sandwich. I don't know how it's called mm -hmm. in German, but it has mozzarella cheese and tomato and some pesto sauce, and that's it. So it's pretty simple, mm -hmm. but it looks so delicious. It, it is delicious, by the way. And I read about databases. And to our viewers, the book that Philip mentioned. database performers are scaled i have been reading this fourth chapter is something what i am reading right now and the one unique thing about this book so far what i found is there are so many amazing quotes that you can truly relate with your work if you have ever faced some issues with databases so something like on observability right or something on throughput and latency there was one quote about there is no unlimited concurrency no data distributed system can have unlimited concurrency period so that's that was a like a very good statement as well it feels like you're talking to someone it's not like reading a book mm -hmm. but you're you feel like you're talking to someone especially if you have some experience with or have painful experience with dealing with databases this book is definitely for you and it's a good journey so far so i'm going to finish this book and also probably post it on twitter or something about what i think about it but i highly recommend it's a free book so everyone please go and check it out i am also going to add this link in the description yeah so thanks philip for the introduction i am really excited to go dive deep into the depths of sila db and understand what is <laughs> happening exactly and first as i do with typically with any other database i want to understand the historical context and set that up right what was the problem that sila db mm -hmm. wanted to solve and why does sila db exist that's actually a very good question because if i go back in history we we never managed to create a new database at first mm -hmm. because if you stop and think you probably know that there are several databases out there uh, cassandra dynamo cockroach yeah. db couchbase etc and so on yeah. and all those databases they do their job pretty well right mm -hmm. so why would we need another database SolidDB was essentially founded by Dorlaur and Avi Kividi, 
and they have been the creators of the KVM hypervisor. So mm. that happened back then when they were working at Inranet, and later on KVM was acquired by Red Hat. So after a couple of years working there, Avi and Dor, they decided to start their own company. And their plan was to create um, essentially a Linux kernel competitor, a unikernel called OSV. And they've got several good results with this unikernel. And uh, they realized that the performance of several applications uh, already performed better than the Linux kernel. But what happened in the between? containers happened. And you, we all know what happened after, right? Containers were uh, extremely successful. Mm -hmm. And then later on, Kubernetes came in and it took over. It's nowadays the de facto standard uh, solution for container orchestration. Yeah. So just, uh, just kind of complicated a little bit the development of OSV, right? Because the market simply shifted to mm -hmm. another kind of technology. But one of the things that we did was Essentially, we ran Apache Cassandra on top of our Unikernel, and we realized that the performance was better than if you were running Apache Cassandra directly on top of the Linux kernel. But even though the performance of Apache Cassandra was much better than compared to running on top of the Linux kernel, one of the things that we realized is that the performance improvements we got were up to a point. And after that point, we noticed that there were several architectural GIP engineering lack of optimization that would prevent the database from scaling further. Mm -hmm. And that's when we realized, hey, there was a market, there, there's a business opportunity here. And that's when we considered, okay, so let's create CivilDB, which is essentially going to be fully API compatible with Apache Cassandra. And that's how essentially CivilDB started. Perfect, yeah. It clearly tells you why CivilDB is directly compared with Apache Cassandra, because that's how it started trying to optimize Apache Cassandra mm -hmm. directly running on the kernel. That makes sense. I've read about CillaDB and there are a few terms that really, they are catchy, let's say monstrously fast and mm -hmm. shared nothing architecture and highly scalable distributed database. How would you define CillaDB? So that's a very, so CillaDB is the result you get when you mix a database with top brilliant mind engineers. Mm -hmm. That's the result you get. Okay. Because and that's essentially what we did, right? We were cooking an operating system and eventually we realized, hey, what if we essentially use all the knowledge we have and we create a database, right? Yeah. And that's how CillaDB was born. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, a, that's what happened. That's a great perspective. And uh, so I've been reading a bit about and hearing some of the talks, like how different companies they were using Apache Cassandra and they were able to, I don't know, move down from, I don't know, 970 machines to let's say 70 machines or something like that. So that's a massive difference. And mm. all of the case studies that I read, it's like this, like massive improvements on top of Apache Cassandra. And I'm, I was more excited to do this podcast just to understand what kind of optimizations are we talking about and what happens underneath. So let's get started to understand how CLRDP works. As I typically do, let's understand from the ingestion path. And as also your book says, you should have a different idea of your write throughput and read throughput in your mind because they are not mm -hmm. same. Just throwing one number for both of them doesn't make sense. So we are also going to understand write and read paths differently. Let's start with the write path, right? We'll cover that later. But let's say I want to ingest some data in the database. Take us through what happens when I call the API to the storage layer. That's a, a very good question. and. Uh... As I said, uh, given that CillaDB is uh, pretty much API compatible with Apache Cassandra, we also inherited several Cassandra concepts. Mm. When you are going to either ingest data or read data, I know we are not talking about the read path yet, it's very easy for us to make a connection to how Cassandra works. So once you write data to a CillaDB cluster, your query is going to land on a coordinator, and this coordinator is essentially going to be responsible for replicating the data to other nodes in your distributed data database cluster. So also your data is going to be stored in two places. So the commit log, which is essentially a write a head log that uh, is stored on disk. And the thing about the commit log is that we never really read from the commit log during normal database operations. Mm -hmm. But in case there is a system outage, a crash or whatever, just then we will need to read from the commit log in order to replay the uh, uh, piece of information which, which would have got lost. And, uh, on top of appending data to the commit log, 
which is essentially a data structure stored on disk. We also store, we also ingest the data to a data structure that lives in the main table. And this main table eventually uh, gets full because the database are constantly receiving writes. It's eventually flush to disk. Mm -hmm. So the write path is very similar to how it works in Cassandra. Yeah. By the way, even though we are, I think that's by now the fourth or fifth time we mention we mention Apache Cassandra. It's I also would like to mention that um, we have two other APIs, querying APIs for SolidDB. One is a DynamoDB fully compatible API. And uh, you may wonder, okay, why have you guys decided to create a uh, DynamoDB fully compatible API? The reasons are quite simple. The data modeling between Apache Cassandra and Dynamo, they are very similar. Mm -hmm. I have seen in other talks, you had people talking about the Google Big Table paper and the Amazon Dynamo paper. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially how Cassandra was born, right? Yeah. As a basis for all those papers. So it was very simple for us to create an, a DynamoDB compatible API. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, we also have Redis API. It's currently in experimental mode. But the overall idea of all those APIs is to essentially make your migration simple. One of the things that we decided not to do with SolidDB was there is no reason for us to create another query language. The existing query language that exists out there, they do their job really uh, well. Yeah. So uh, creating a different query language will only make uh, migration and adoption of our database to be more complicated. But yeah, that's also another reason why we started with Apache Cassandra. Later on, we added support for uh, Amazon DynamoDB API, and we also have a Redis experimental API. Cool. Yeah. So it, it sounds like the right path that you explained is, as you mentioned, it's pretty similar to what happens inside Cassandra as well, right? So there's a, as you mentioned, log structured uh, data structure that you use and it's written on two places. One mm -hmm. is the write ahead log for durability, which is pretty common. And then you uh, also log it in the LSM tree. And then it is merged and whatever compaction happens and yeah, it's pretty standard, happens, yeah. right? Yep. But what makes it fast then? Like what makes it faster than Cassandra? Let's address Very the elephant good. in the room. Yeah, I was expecting this question because that's essentially most people reaction. So you guys work in and implement a lot of things in a similar way than Cassandra. It's worth to mention that in our implementation, we do so, do several code optimizations here and there, etc. and so forth. We can definitely later on discuss about some SolidDB specific things that we purposefully decided to implement in a different way than Cassandra does, as well as some operations that we have improved it. But what makes SolidDB the most most closely fast and highly scalable database, which is oriented for high throughput, low latency workloads? Mm -hmm. Essentially, if, I, if, if we start talking about the SolidDB architecture on a very low level, I can probably split it in two parts. SolidDB is built on top of a framework which we call CSTAR, okay? Mm -hmm. And this star is essentially a C++ framework for high performance types of applications. Mm -hmm. Is it just SolidDB which uses C star? No, there are other open source projects using SolidDB in production today, such as Ready Panda. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have re uh, read about Ready Panda, but it's essentially a fully compatible Kafka API, just like SolidDB is a fully is fully compatible with. Patch Cassandra, but also more performant. So what are the main aspects about CSTAR? CSTAR is essentially follows just a uh, shard per core architecture. And uh, it also essentially has the shard, shared knotting deployment model. It's worth to mention here that when we talk about shared knotting, it's different than the shared knotting that Cassandra employees. Mm -hmm. So in a Cassandra, in Apache Cassandra deployment, your database topology, your architecture is shared nothing because every node is leaderless. That's how the Apache Cassandra architecture is. It's essentially leaderless and that's how you get shared nothing. Well, uh, a single node, all the resources are shared nothing. Mm -hmm. So that's when we get to actually to the shared per core concept. If we stop and think about how computers evolved in, I don't know, the last decade, we will very clearly see how much their processing power, the amount of memory per, uh, in a single, the amount of memory a single VM can hold has dramatically increased. The storage, the storage medium speeds have dra dramatically improved. Essentially what CSTAR does is it's, it, it looks into a single, uh, 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 a single server 
and the partitions all the resources equally. So every single CPU is what you call a shard of your data. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we get the memory that you have in your server and we also partition it equally. So each shard, each CPU core is essentially an independent unit on your server. Mm. And also you add several, also you create a CLDB cluster, you essentially have several shards, several independent units, which are essentially able to scale as much as your hardware can do. And that's essentially the, the secret sauce of CLDB's unlimited scalability and high throughput and performance. Because CSTAR essentially has a future promise programming architecture and everything that's our operations that CSTAR essentially executes are asynchronous. And we also implement several other features such as scheduling groups, etc., and so on. On top of CSTAR, uh, this is what makes it essentially very high performance. Another thing that running that CSTAR allows us to avoid is the infamous garbage collection pauses, which are very famous in when you're using, when you're running your application or your database on top of a middle tier framework like Java or Golang, et cetera, and so on. Yeah. Right. So simply by programming in C++, by writing the database in CSTAR, its framework in C++ allow us to get rid of garbage collection pauses. But yeah. I, I, I mentioned that there are two main aspects in CLDB which contributes to high performance. One is CSTAR, and the second one is our own caching implementation, and that's CLA specific. So another differentiator between CLDB and Apache Cassandra, since that's what we are comparing over here, is the fact that while Apache Cassandra manages memory with the help of the Linux page cache, we decided to implement our own, to, to essentially have our own cache implementation. And we have done some benchmarks, millions of operations per second with a latency of below one millisecond, a, a single millisecond, which is truly impressive for the P99. So some of the benefits, it, it, it's not, uh, as you may guess, it's not really an easy engineering effort yeah. because there are several considerations you to, to consider when you are essentially going to bypass your default operating system memory management. Yeah. But some of the benefits that we immediately get is the fact that you have upfront the visibility of how your cache is performing. For example, if you go and you open the CLDB monitoring stack, you will know upfront which date, how many cache hits you have, how many cache misses you are having. On top of that, the cache, given that we have our own implementation of our cache, we know exactly how to properly manage it. So if you, if we were to rely on the Linux page cache, one of the things that could happen is that Linux could evict data mm -hmm. from its page cache, uh, that could potentially be needed by the application. But since the, since we have our own cache implementation, we know the, which data is important, which data should be evicted and which data should be populated and how it should be populated. So these are just, this, this is really a, a, a real quick summary of some of the op optimizations. Uh, we have done on top of CLDB. Another thing we have implemented in, in, in CSTAR is a concept which we call scheduling groups and the priority I.O. classes. Mm -hmm. So what are those? So if, when you are working with a distributed database, and if there's any database, there are always background operations which we will need to run under the yeah. hood. Since we, uh, if we use Cassandra and CLDB as an example, that will be times when compaction will have to run, right? Uh, eventually you may have uh, a failure on your infrastructure and you may need to replace that node. And once you start replacing that node, what will happen is that uh, most of the nodes in your cluster will start streaming data to that node. And those background operations, uh, inevitably, they will, uh, uh, they may harm your latency. Hmm. So the overall idea of uh, priority classes and uh, scheduling groups is to essentially avoid uh, those background operations from hindering down your end user workload. Uh, uh, if you will do a quick Google search, you will probably see several reports of people saying, hey, compactions are dragging down my workload latencies. Yeah. And then people will start tuning compaction, which is, can be really a very painful thing to do. If you yeah. don't get your compaction settings correctly, it can be really get really frustrating. But with CLDB, it's much more simple because the overall idea of IO priority class is that we will prioritize the user workload and we will simply slow down 
those background operations. Mm -hmm. And also your, your workload subsides, maybe you are in, in the middle of a peak, then we will speed up those background tasks. So this is one of the optimizations that we did. Another thing that we have done is we implemented our own IO scheduler. And this, is, this has been done pretty much ever since the beginning of SuaDB. Mm -hmm. So why, what is, and why do we need an IO scheduler? It's pretty simple. Given that there are several, several operations happening internally to a database. For example, we just talked about the write path and I said, so on the write path, we have to append data to the commit log. And then eventually your main table is going to get full and uh, what will happen will be a main table flush. And typically when a main table flush happens, compaction will start. And in, uh, at the same time, your workload is trying to write and read the data. Mm -hmm. So how do we control all those internal operations running concurrently? And we give all of them a fair share of resources. From a disk perspective, if we compare the access time of memory with disk, we all know that the memory access speeds are much faster than ac accessing the disk. So essentially what we did was we created this user space by your scheduler mm -hmm. and uh, for each of those tasks requiring access to your underlying gist, we essentially, we try not to kill them, but it may happen that we kill them and with that, we will essentially prioritize each, each task accordingly. So it may be compactions do not need a high priority right now. So let's give our end user workload the priority to write data to the gist. So that's how uh, the, the overall idea of uh, implementing an I.O. scheduler. I definitely have some questions there. So you mentioned oh, so many important points. So I just want to break those down and try to understand each of them uh, in more depth. Mm -hmm. So first thing uh, you mentioned, so it's pretty much like at a high level, it's pretty much similar to how Cassandra works. But then you have a C star framework, which enables you to have more control on how things are happening internally and how, for example, the shard per core architecture. So it means that, let's say you have one machine that has 100 cores. So each core in itself is a separate shard for the database, right? And then each of that core will get its own resource, like memory and CPU and I don't know, network or cache or whatever. So whatever it requires to, to handle all the workflows, it will get it as a separate thing. And you also mentioned, instead of using the Linux page cache, you have a custom cache implementation. So you can have more control on how cache entries are evicted and all of those things, right? So basically the idea, if I have to break it down at a high level, the idea is to get more control and not let the operating system decide what happens with the, the database. You have more control on when the background process runs, when the cache entries are evicted, and that gives you the ability to give right priority depending on if compaction is required, give it more priority. If the real workload requires more priority, then give that more priority, something like that. So at a high level, these are the main mm -hmm. points. I want to talk a little bit more on the shard per core thing, right? I think the idea is to share, to get this shared nothing architecture, but at a more granular level. So now each shard or each core mm -hmm. is a shard for you. And what is the benefit of that? Is it increased parallelism that you get? Is there more to it? Well, the main benefit, put in simple terms, is the ability of essentially the single shard will be able to fully maximize your computing resources without doing expensive context switches, uh, without, you know, doing cross core communication, which can be very detrimental to latencies. Mm -hmm. So that's the overall idea of it. So essentially, in, in C-star terms, we call it a reactor. But what happens when you start CLDB or any application running that you, was created on top of, written on top of C-star, is that C-star will essentially, in a single thread, it's a single thread on every single CPU that you, mm. you have, and uh, we call those threads C-star okay. reactor. And then we will start dispatching uh, work to, and this reactor will essentially work like in a busy loop executing all the work that you were submitting to it. Of course, one of the main, it's not a simple architecture because as you may guess, if you have a single thread running in your CPU and this thread blocks, your CPU will be basically yeah. idle. But that's why we essentially have an asynchronous uh, type of architecture because this thread may mm -hmm. never block. So it's always doing some work under the hood. And that's essentially the beauty of the uh, 
the shared core architecture. It's essentially fully maximizing the utilization of your hardware. And that's how companies who move it from Cassandra to Solidity were able to see several gains in reducing their deployment size, mm. increasing their to, to while still lowering their latency. It's uh, that there is no yeah. witchery here. It's pretty much simply using your hardware in the way it was supposed that to be used, sense. right? Yeah. Because if we, yeah, if we circle back to the relational, the traditional application engineering method where you will really typically create several threads, it's very easy for you to introduce performance products, right? I don't know if you ever did a research, but uh, a couple of years ago, we had the sole widely known spectrum metal vulnerabilities. And several, I, I recall that I was working in another company. I wasn't part of Celebrity back mm -hmm. at the time. But when those vulnerabilities came out, a lot of people were, they weren't really sure if they should have been patching their servers because the fixes would essentially introduce a performance mm -hmm. penalty. And the performance penalty introduced by the Spectrum meltdown fixes were primarily in applications running multi-threading in their typical multi-threading approach. We, in SilaDB, we have run the same benchmarks with and without those fixes and the performance has been pretty much the same. With or without the Spectrum meltdown fixes, you will have pretty much have zero performance impact because there is no cache mm. sidelines, there is no uh, cross-core communication, etc. and so forth. So that's that the whole sense. idea of it. I, yeah, yeah, I think that makes sense and that's fair enough. I, I have a sort of naive question and I don't know if it makes sense, but mm -hmm. since we are talking about these machines that have high number of cores, because in, in modern world it's possible, if let's say I have machines that only have one core, right? So will the performance then be equivalent to Cassandra? You no, know, it still should be better given that once you turn up, Cassandra is still is developed in yeah, Java, yeah. right? Garbage so, C++, yeah, you will still have the garbage collection. Hmm. And uh, really, as I said, there are several uh, improvements that we have done, uh, both in the SQL API, et cetera, and so on, to improve the performance of SilaDB as a whole. But I mean, it's actually a good point. The, the only thing is that most individuals will uh, run distributed database on a single yeah. core. Right. Even if you get the smaller, probably the smallest cloud instance that you can find in AWS or GCP nowadays, we will at least give you two cores of processing power. But this, I think I will actually answer your question on a different way. So what if you were running a SilaDB cluster, say with a two core machine, will it perform in the same way as, for example, if you're running it on a 16 core machine? Very likely, the node with more cores, the larger node, yeah. will perform better. And uh, there is one specific reason for that. So one of the things that, one of the optimizations that we do in SilaDB is that we essentially ping, we ping your network interrupts to a specific CPU cores that SilaDB is not going to be using. Why is that? Because as interrupts can be very detrimental to performance. So imagine every time you are doing some processing, the Linux kernel receives an interrupt from your network card, and then it has to stop everything, handle the interrupt, and then get back on processing. To avoid this kind of performance penalty, the more CPU, the more shards you have on your node, we will essentially equally reserve some TPUs for specifically handling this interrupt in such a way that your workload can work uh, without any sort of interruptions. The last shard you have, for example, in your example one or two the CPUs, we don't have too many room to reserve yeah. spare CPUs for interrupt. And in that case, there's pretty much nothing we can do other than simply accept the yeah, penalty job. Absolutely. So <laughs> is, is it fair to say that if a high number of cores are used in production, like as as many cores as possible for you, that, that will give you real performance benefits? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. That yes, makes sense. Correct. And it also works to mention that uh, our architecture linearly scales. Mm -hmm. For example, if you have a three node cluster doing, I don't know, 300,000 operations per second, if you double that cluster capacity, you will get it and it's granted. You will get it 600,000 operations okay. per second. We have done this uh, exercise several times. More recently, our CEO, Dorla, or he gave like a 30 minutes talk just on the shard per core architecture because it's such an engineering yeah. beauty that he created that it's really worth studying it more closely. But I helped him to run some benchmarks and we have run benchmarks starting 
from AWS i4i two Excel nodes onto the i4i mm -hmm. metal. So it was essentially a cluster with each up to 128 mm -hmm. shards each. And uh, our results have been pretty much, it always doubles the, as you double pretty your good. hardware. And that's the beauty of our architecture. Now, I know that some other databases say that they also linearly scale, but that's very unlikely. You can get close to linear scalability, but unless you are implementing diverse engineering approaches and this same thing that you are doing with SQLDB yeah. architecture, it's very unlikely that you get exact linear scalability. Cool. I think these are great yeah. points and these are great insights. We talk about these and uh, since we are just discussing these concepts, it may sound simplistic, but there's so much more to it. And I definitely recommend viewers to dig deep into it, read more articles and get better understanding. But this is a good high level understanding is what I can say. Jumping back on the right path, we mentioned that it mm -hmm. selects, let's say a coordinator because it is, it, it's again a leaderless architecture, right? If I'm not wrong. So it mm -hmm. picks up a coordinator yes, and right. then it, it makes the right how is the coordinator picked? Is it exactly the same as Cassandra because there's a partition key and then there's a clustering key and also talk a little bit about the data model part. What are we looking at? Very good. Very good question. So yeah, I think that's the moment when we are essentially going to deep dive a little bit on the CLDB yeah. specific. To answer your question, it will depend on the driver that mm. you are using. For example, if you are using a vendor driver, then the way your coordinator is going to be picked is pretty much in the same way because you are using a Cassandra driver. One of the important things that it's worth for me to point out is that given that we have just a leaderless architecture and our nodes, each node is independent from each other, it's a responsibility of the driver to decide on how to actually load balancing queries across your cluster, existing mm -hmm. cluster neighbors. Right, so the database by itself, it has pretty much zero involvement in doing that. But if you are using a CLDB driver, then there is one improvement that we added on top of the Apache Cassandra drivers, which is what we call shared mm. awareness. And this is how it works on the very, on, on the technical level. Your application is going to connect to your database the database is one of the things that a driver does is to essentially ask for the server, what are the options that the server support? And which is essentially, what is the SQL version that, that you support? So that the driver knows how to actually interact with the database, because as you may guess, the Cassandra, the SQL protocol changes over time, right? Yeah. So it evolves and that the driver needs to know what, how he should be doing driving yeah. requests to the database. So what we did is that as a as part of the server's response back to the driver, when the driver is requesting for this information, we uh, extended the SQL protocol for it to also tell the driver how many shards the node that it is connecting to currently has. And with that information, the driver knowing how many shards the node has, essentially what the driver uh, will do is, okay, so let's say I have a cluster with eight shards. What it will do, it, it will open eight connections and for each of the, those eight connections, it will select a, a search port such that the model of the search connection port with the model of the number of shards that the node has is actually the shard that the driver okay. wants to connect. So those op eight connections will essentially be one for each shard. And uh, why is that important? Why is it important to, that you open a single connection to each shard? is because you, you reduce your latency even further, right? Because uh, if you are ref using a Cassandra driver, uh, it may happen that you open a connection to a, a given shard and uh, once you send a query, this query actually lives on a different shard. So the coordinator will need to communicate with another shard or CPU in order to retrieve that information. And this, as you may imagine, can be the remain of two latencies. So that's one of the optimizations that we did on the CLDB driver. And I think uh, it addresses your question on how is it yeah. different from a client's perspective to connect to between Cassandra or Scylla? What's the remaining of your question? 
the mainly the data model part of it say so cassandra has this partition key which decides where the data would exist and how what will be the coordinator for this so how does the data model look like when we are talking about scylla scylla db so because there is a partition key which has let's say a primary id and then the clustering key on which the data is sorted so yeah. you can run ordered queries and what not so how, how is it different in scylla db or it's the same it's our data modeling is pretty much the same so we also have yeah. partition keys we also have clustering keys and you can also create composite keys when we talk about the token ring architecture the algorithm is pretty much the same the way the murmur tree hash is calculated uh, also the driver is going to actually route a query to is also the same because again the overall idea was not we didn't want it to break the compatibility at all otherwise it wouldn't make any sense it's, it shed some light to what i said back then that if we were to simply change how the actual implementation how the actual interaction with the database work it it's too much make the adoption of our database yeah, yeah. much harder that said what we did and we are still doing is to actually introduce new concepts that we feel like the SQL mm -hmm. protocol is missing. For example, one of those extensions is what we call using timeout. What is using timeout? Many times you, when you are running a data, many times when you are running Cassandra, it may be that you simply want to run a query that may take potentially a long period of time, right? Maybe, I don't know, you are running a token range scan, doing a full table scan, and uh, maybe this query may take, I don't know, five seconds, which is completely normal if you are doing some sort of analytics or a, uh, an aggregation of a, a, a large amount of data. And Cassandra doesn't provide you really an easy way for you to specify a timeout mm -hmm. per query. So in the configuration file, you can set your read and your write timeout settings, but you cannot do it really per query. So what's the problem? Let's say that your P99 requirements is 300 milliseconds, yeah. which is really high. So I'm giving you some headroom, some good, very good through over here. Then you go to uh, Apache Cassandra and you configure it and just say, okay, my read timeout, uh, any reads that get past 300 milliseconds should timeout, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but what if you want later on to run a query that may take potentially two cycles? Again, it's not really close to your application. Uh, but it's a side process that you need to run, such as analytics. And with CLDB, we introduced the using timeout, which allows you on a per level for you to determine how long the coordinator should wait before it fails a query. It just allows you to run several uh, use cases. Another SQL extension that we have done, mm -hmm. bypass cache. So I, I told you that CLDB implements its own cache, but and what happens when you read the data is that by default, SillaDB will always populate the cache with this data. If it's not read in the cache, once it reads from disk, it will ensure that the data you read always leave, always gets populated in the cache. What's the problem of that is that the problem is that if you are doing some sort of, you typically don't want to populate all this data to your cache because your cache will end up by evicting the data that your application is using. So you simply uh, use the bypass cache, SQL extension, and uh, what SillaDB will do, it will simply go read from the disk or from the main table, if the data exists on the main table, and it will not populate the cache. So that's a way for you to run uh, real-time and analytics workloads uh, all together without really impacting the latencies of your real-time mm -hmm. workloads. That, that's interesting. Yeah. And so uh, you mentioned that for making the migrations easier, because people want to migrate, uh, let's say, to SillaDB, if the API layer stays the same, it's going to be easier for them. And then we also talked about how the sharding, the shard-aware architecture also helped. And I guess we also spilled a little bit over the read path as well, because we talked about the cache, about the query timeouts. I'm curious. Mm -hmm. So I guess we should just uh, focus a little bit on the read path first, and then I'll come back to some of the questions that I have on this. Uh, I guess the read path is also pretty similar, but I guess the caching implementation that you have might be more relevant in the read path, right? The cache is primarily relevant in a read path. You are right. But one of the things uh, on the right path specifically is that once a main table, once your main mm -hmm. table gets slushed to an SS table, what happens to the main table? Do we simply destroy it? No, the data yeah. is actually fresh. So we also populate it in, in, okay. into the cache. So this is what happens uh, under the hood. Because later on, there, there's a very high chance that you will need to read that data in a short period of time. This is typically how real-time application works. 
And on the read path, yeah. So if you are reading data without specifying the bypass cache clause that I previously mentioned, then your data will get populated into the cache. So it works pretty much as any cache would expect. Read path is pretty similar to how the routing is done on the write path. It, uh, things are pretty similar, except that the throughput requirement mm -hmm. is different and the latency requirement is different. So what are some optimizations? And if you, unless you want to bypass the cache for some reason, it will be heavily cached and you can just directly access the cache information and then send it back. So that is definitely one of the optimizations. But what are some other optimizations that are happening on the read path specifically? Yeah, okay. Uh, so one of the optimizations that we implemented on the read path is one of the things, and I'm sorry, but I will have to say the word caching because that's how we name it. Hmm. But uh, it's called uh, index caching. Uh, so as you know, SS tables have several components. So there is the, that component which actually holds your data. There is the index, there is the bull filter. It's essentially a table of contents. There yeah. are a summary, several co components. <laughs> and it happens that I mentioned most of them. <laughs> One of those components is actually the index, which whenever you are going to read the data and, and the data doesn't exist in the cache, uh, uh, your reader yeah. have to go to, by default, to the disk. And uh, the first thing that your read will do is, still a DB will do is it will, check the bull filter, right? And if the data is there, then you to scan the index. And by scanning the index, it will know yeah. what are the chunks of data to read from the disk in order to get close to the data where which you want to retrieve. So index caching is essentially one of the optimization that we did, which involves instead of every single time you have to go to the disk and read, you will open the file, you read the index, etc., mm -hmm. and so on just to store those index into the cache <laughs> so that you can avoid this entire round trip just to read the data. And by doing that, we have essentially been able to mitigate large partitions, for example. By the way, uh, large partitions is, of course, it's a name mm -hmm. pattern in Apache Cassandra, in DynamoDB, and other NoSQL databases. But in StellaDB, I have seen large partitions, believe it or not, of over one terabyte in size. And the database was working just fine. The user was able to read from those large partitions. And all of those are essentially uh, benefits what pays off uh, all of those optimizations that we did. That makes sense. Uh, so we talked about sorry, chart uh, uh, core and think. also partition of data, right? How are these two related? Is it one-to-one -one mapping or is it one-to-many? Very good question, yeah. That, because that's a question that several users also have. So as a partition, essentially, once you write data uh, to a partition, it's essentially going to be hashed, mm. and the result yeah. of this hash is going to result in a token, right? And and this token is going to be placed in a token ring, and depending on the V nodes yeah. that your nodes essentially acquired during the initial bootstrap in the cluster, it, it will determine whether this token belongs yeah. to one of the token ranges owned by those specific nodes. So what we do is very simple, actually. For mm -hmm. each of those V nodes, which are the token ranges that your node owns, we essentially apply an algorithm on top of it. If I recall correctly, we okay. ignore the last, the 12 most significant bits, something like that. And with that, we uh, okay. compute to which shard this token should belong. That's how it works. It, it looks like to it's similar to consistent like, hashing. Exactly. We go to them yeah. having these V nodes and all, right? And the shard per core is different. It's mainly for processing mm -hmm. side. And the partition that we are talking about is mainly on yeah. how the data is stored and where it is stored. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. One of the things that, yeah, one of the things that I really want people to understand about SillaDB and how the shard per core architecture works under the hood is the fact that this architecture is very high performance, but there are definitely some sacrifices and some trade-offs that you need to be aware of. So what are some of the trade-offs? For example, mm -hmm. if you have a hot partition and or large partition, given that everything is going to be handled by a single shard in a single CPU, it's, mm -hmm. it may become much more easy for you to see performance problems. Yeah, so yeah, that's essentially what uh, most people should be aware of. Thankfully, however, given that in our monitoring solution, we have observability per shard, such situations are much easier for you to, to find it than it would be on Cassandra. One thing that you also mentioned in the book is it's about reducing the number of disk I.O. while you're reading data. And it can be easily identified by the cache hit and miss ratio, right? 
So if that is so, so it, it clearly means you need to either give more memory or increase the mm-hmm. cache size so it avoids reading the disk, right? So observability is definitely one of the key aspects of any database. Are there any specific metrics that you typically recommend for both understanding the write throughput and read throughput to your customers which that, that are new to SillaDB? Yeah, very good. The good thing about the SillaDB monitoring stack is that, as I said, it provides visibility just for you in like several granular ways. Yeah. So you can see your metrics on mm-hmm. cluster level, per data center level, per instance level, mm-hmm. per shard level. So the more deep you go, the more data points you will have in order for you to analyze. My first recommendation without going into any specific metrics is try to look into on a very high level first. So if you have a multi-region cluster, look into on a per data center level, because typically most people will only look into their metrics when either when they are having one problem <laughs> or when they are actually trying to understand some hacked hect- behavior or trying to improve something. So try to look into those because it, it will essentially help you to understand if the problem is isolated to one region or isolated to a single node and so on. So that's how you should be gradually seeing your problem. The second thing is it pretty much depends on the on what you are looking after because I, again, we have several panels and you are right. If you don't know what you are after, you will not know what to look. But I can definitely throw, throw in some examples. For example, uh, if you are seeing timeouts on your application, you will typically want to look into the uh, advanced dashboard. You will want to see yeah. for the IO, IO priority classes. Remember that I said you start has them. Yeah, so you'll be able to see for commit log, for compaction, for your workload, what is the, how much time it's typically spending on disk, how much percent of CPU each class is consuming. And there you will be able to have an idea, oh, maybe I have a bottleneck on my disk, etc. and so on. If you are, for example, seeing a, a, a hot partition, if you're seeing a, a shard receiving much more requests than other, then you may, maybe that shard is slow than its counterparts, or maybe your application is simply blasting that shard with unlimited concurrency. For that, in the detailed dashboard, we have some panels which you call foreground and background writes and reads. So what is a foreground write slash read? It's essentially queries that are sent to your application, by your application to the server, but which haven't yet been acknowledged back by the server. So it's essentially killed on the SillaDB server side, wait for, waiting for some spare resources, spare capacity for it to get dispatched. And a background queue is essentially queries which have already been replied back to your client application, but they still need some additional work before the yeah. coordinator can properly flag them as done. Such as, for example, replication, right? You write the data, you, the, the, your coordinator needs to replicate this data to other nodes, uh, or maybe update a materialized view. So those kind of things are some examples of background activities that may be required after we acknowledge the process, processing of a query back to the client. And why are those panels important? Because if, we, if you say that either your background or foreground queues are mm-hmm. growing too big, it may mean that you have a limited concurrency on your application. That makes sense. And since we talked a bit about, so the write path is clear, the read path is clear, the different optimizations are pretty clear. I'm pretty sure there are tons of more optimizations if we go even deeper down the stack. But unfortunately, we have limited time, so we mainly discussed the key observations that we wanted to highlight. One question I had on the, uh, so you mentioned that, so of course, each machine has several cores and then each core gets started. Is it recommended to have like similar kind of machines in a cluster? So let's say one machine with 100 cores, the other machine with, let's say, 10 cores, whatever is available on the cloud, for example. Does that also create some kind of disbalance or is it recommended that to have homogeneous machines? It does. We typically recommend you to have a homogeneous cluster. And the reason is because if you have, let's say, as I said, one node with 10 shards and another node with 100 shards, given the, given how data gets distributed and how it gets hashed in your cluster, what can happen is that, for example, Mm -hmm. a given partition lives on shard, I don't know, 20, Mm -hmm. 
in one node, but that same partition is a replica of shard eight in the other node. And when those shards are going to communicate, this may introduce some level of overhead. Another reason why we don't recommend you to do it is because in a distributed system, and here it's not just CLDB, but it, that's general distributed systems theory, you have to remember that your cluster will, the speed of a distributed system is always yeah. driven by its lowest replica. There are many use cases and case studies that CLDB features on its website, right? If you have to pick, let's say, one of the case studies and you want to highlight one use case mm -hmm. which really you found interesting the, the type of optimizations they have been able to do in their application what will be that one i am speaking from the top of my mind <laughs> i'm sorry if someone for silla db later will read this and say hey why haven't you said discord because guys i think everyone knows silla db i think yeah pretty much everyone first has an introduction to silla db out of discord blogs but the workload the use case that i would definitely definitely ask people to mm -hmm. take a look would be the traction one because traction is actually an interesting one they were running in MongoDB. Mm -hmm. they were pretty much doing what most companies out mm -hmm. there do so they start small they select given database be it their postgres mongo without and it works are in the beginning right and by the time after a couple of years or so by the time they start to get more traffic more users they realize that those solutions are no longer able to deliver the requirement and that's when they start searching for other competitors other solutions they consider cassandra or maybe CillaDB. and what i really like about traction mm -hmm. is that they wrote now it's a very concise blog it's a very small post where they explain it point by point, reasons why they decided not to go with Postgres, the reason why they had to get out of Mongo, and how CLDB actually helped them to get there. And they also share in their talk the benchmarks, the results, and everything is super impressive. So this essentially, because one of the things that I want people to avoid is just thinking that, hey, CillaDB is only oriented for applications at a very high scale. No, you don't need to be at a very high scale. As long as you have a performance problem and uh, you want to uh, improve improve from it, you definitely should consider CillaDB down your stack. Before we end this amazing session, and uh, so there is there are two things, right? One is optimizing for throughput. The other one is optimizing for latency, right? If I have to and also, CillaDB says it is also vertically scalable and horizontally scalable, right? It supports both. If Is it fair to say that if I have to increase the throughput, mm -hmm. I would increase or scale horizontally? If I have to optimize for latency, I'll focus more on vertical scaling. Is that fair to say as a thumb rule or there's more to it? No, not necessarily. Uh, you can scale out or scale up no matter what you want to improve. So one of the things, but you actually touch your base on a very important subject. When you say I want to improve my latency, if you are not getting your latency numbers that you would expect in the mm -hmm. current, uh, in your current implementation, in your current mm -hmm. sizing or okay. so on, then it means that you are introducing a uh, contention to your database. Whenever you are, you want to optimize for latency, you definitely don't want to introduce any sort of contention because as you have contention in any bit either CPU, GIST, or yeah. maybe you don't have enough memory, if, if it's a really heavy use case, memory is particularly important. Mm -hmm. The moment you, you introduce contention, your latency is going to climb up. So you definitely need more resources. This is different than scaling for a throughput. So uh, every workload has its own latency requirements, and every distinct workload also has different uh, latency requirements than one another. So it makes the, the math mm -hmm. even more complicated. That's what makes distributed systems even uh, truly impressive because one, so one solution never fits. But throughput, you can very easily scale with without even mm -hmm. needing to scale out your infrastructure. Mm -hmm. As long as the latency numbers you're getting are sufficient for your B99, yeah. just go ahead and blast the server as hard as you can. And uh, honestly, because I have, seriously, I have run benchmarks with a six node cluster doing 1 million operations per second. And uh, I can reproduce those numbers like 10 times out of 10 times. Easily reproducible. 
uh, in the interest of time please. we have to end this session otherwise i would pass so many more questions to you uh but thanks a lot philip for answering and helping us understand right. more how celadp <laughs> works and i'm pretty sure this episode is at least at the least going to make people more curious to learn more about celadp so i'm going to add all the necessary links and all the references that we have made also reference to the book that philip has uh, authored So yeah, I'm really excited that we did this and I'm more excited to release this episode. So thanks a lot Philip, it was really insightful. Thank you.